So now it is my great pleasure to introduce our first presentation of the day. We have worked throughout the year with the media research firm Maggot to assess the current landscape of parental controls and find out what parents and teens think of these online safety tools. Uh, before I ask Molly Ludwig and Rich McGuire of Maggot to take us through their findings, I want to thank Verizon for their generous funding of this project and Ethan Aronson in particular, who steered it through. Verizon has been a supportive partner throughout this process, and we are very grateful for this opportunity to collaborate on a shared goal of better supporting and informing parents. So without further ado, I will turn things over to Molly and Rich to walk us through the findings of Tools for Today's Digital Parents. Hi, hello everybody. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for the introduction and the opportunity to present this research today. Rich and I have spent our careers gaining insight into how people make decisions. And we believe nothing could be more valuable than understanding how parents are making decisions about how to protect their children and teach them to grow into smart digital citizens. Uh, and we also are very excited to present to you some ideas around what could be done by the industry to help them do the best possible job of this. To unpack what is going on, oops, sorry. Next slide, please. To unpack what is going on with parents and online safety, we set out to address three key questions. Number one, what are the motivators for parents to use parental controls? And on the flip side, what are the barriers preventing them from using parental controls? Two, what do parents think about the tools that are already out there in the market today and how are they using them or not? And three, from an outcome standpoint, how can the media and tech industries most effectively meet parents' needs with solutions that fit their families? Uh, based on the extensive work that Rich and I do with kids and families, we also recommended talking to teens about this topic. As any of you parents out there understand, parents are not alone in this safety endeavor. As we study time and again in our research, the overall family dynamic ultimately influences decision-making on the topic of online safety, how devices are used, and the content that kids consume. Understanding the teen perspective gives us an additional valuable layer of insight to help us to that final goal of figuring out how we can most effectively meet parents' needs on this topic. So we'll be sprinkling in these teen insights throughout the, uh, throughout the presentation. We came out of this research with four key takeaways that we see as most important for you to know. Number one, online safety parental controls are very overwhelming to parents. Because of this, there is a very strong parental interest in a one-stop shop uh, hub for information. Uh, they're looking for guidance, a full service resource for information and tips about how to navigate online safety with their children. Uh, most services offer their own safety centers and this is great, but it adds to parents' feelings of being overwhelmed by the sheer enormity of available online safety controls and, uh, and tools. Number two, we uncovered some very interesting generational differences on multiple measures with regards to how parents think and act when it comes to online safety. With millennial parents being digital natives, looking for more support and solutions from the industry, then this is a trend that we think is likely to continue to grow in coming years. Number three, there's a lot of white space in this marketplace. New solutions that really get at the heart of parental concerns could help companies fill this void. And we're gonna dive into what those biggest concerns are. And finally, tweens, the seven to 11 year old group is really a critical age to reach parents with useful safety solutions. This is that crossover time between littles and teens where so much happens and the need for both protection and education is at its peak. And getting it right for kids this age helps grease the skids going into those trickier teenage years. An overarching theme of our findings is that families go through an evolution of sorts as their kids move through the different developmental stages of childhood and are increasingly influenced beyond their parents, by friends, by media, as well as by the introduction of new tech devices into the household. We see that with the youngest kids, two to six, it's really about laying the groundwork for their digital life, limitations, rules about what they can watch, 
it's easier for parents to monitor at this age. And as I've already brought up, that important seven to 11 year old group, those tweens, parental controls, sorry, parent concerns really increase at this age. Uh, parents need to start reacting to specific incidents that kids experience. This is why we're calling out this age is so important. It is when we see an increase in parental engagement in online tools and almost a, a, a panic reaction, like, wait, how am I supposed to manage all of this? Uh, they lose some oversight. They can't keep up with the speed at which new content and new sources of content and new interests are coming on board. Things are changing faster than a lot of parents feel equipped to keep up with. Ultimately, we characterize this as a journey towards trust because the two to six age, the seven to 11 age, are leading to this important teenage years. Uh, and they all set the stage for the teenage years that so many parents fear. They feel like they're gonna be out of control at that point. However, we have heard from parents and teens that if the right steps are taken um, as kids lead up to their teenage years, they're in a much better spot. All right, so we utilize three approaches to address these objectives. First, uh, we conducted an audit of parental controls and safety tools across the landscape. Uh, we also conducted primary qualitative and quantitative research, uh, kicked off with online communities with parents and online communities with teens, uh, and followed by an online survey with parents of kids aged 2 to 17. So prior to the primary research, as we said, we evaluated and compared parental control tools with across various types of media platforms and standalone third-party solutions. We evaluated and compared third-party parental control apps, devices and routers, social media, video conferencing, games and gaming platforms, audio and streaming services and browsers. As this parent of a tween articulates, they feel there's so much out there and so little guidance for parents uh, it's really hard for them to navigate the options and make informed decisions that are right for their families, which is really important. Our biggest findings of the audit shows there's a lot of similarities in what companies are doing for parental safety and controls, but there is absolutely an opportunity for innovation across the space. In our primary research, we started out by establishing where parents currently stand with regards to being involved with their kids' digital lives, including what conversations they've had and what rules they've established. We also heard from teens on the topic of parental controls and rules. And as this video illustrates, they have ex they express a variety of feelings about parental controls and online safety tools, largely tying back to this concept of trust. pretty happy about the rules that my parents set and the um, control that they have over it because they don't really have much control and I don't feel the need to go out of the control that they give me because I don't want to like die or see weird things. Parental controls, I wouldn't say that they are strict but they are there. Um, it's really just monitoring my activity. I get that it's more of a being safe and wanting to know where your child is, but it just shows that like you trust them, but not enough. I wish parents would be more mindful with parental controls and how invasive it can be. And like, instead of arguing with their child or just implementing it, have a talk with your child and not argue about it and just listen to them and understand where they're coming in their point of view. Um, so, as you can see, kids have very mixed emotions about these parental controls. Some are okay with them. Some are feeling like, you know, maybe they're a little bit overbearing. Uh, parents also tell us that they are involved in the digital life of their kids. Nearly all have established what we call house rules. So verbal rules that they've, um, that they've set for their kids that they expect their kids to follow. Uh, the most common house rules are things around online interactions with people that kids know, um, understanding um, bullying, etiquette, appropriate comments, how to behave online, essentially. Um, also, uh, what they're watching. So this starts very young and carries on through the 
through the tween years, we see that it tends to start to fall off around the teen years. Uh, another house role uh, often revolves around screen time and device usage. This is something that often carries through from very young into the teen years as parents try and get a grasp on exactly how much time is spent on screens versus the other things. Uh, and then also the use of social media. Uh, there's, there, this increases as kids get older, it's starting younger and younger as more and more tweens are having access to social media, younger, uh, but definitely a key concern um, and, and point of conversation for parents of teens. Uh, we also see formal rules. So formal rules are those that parents are using uh, controls for. They tend to be doing settings, so for online interaction like blockers, um, privacy and hacking type settings. Uh, some for what kids are watching, so ratings, uh, Rating settings or age settings that lots of uh, like streaming services, for example, provide or offer. And then also just general use of the internet, what websites kids can visit and not. Um, we were also be curious to know what parents were talking to their kids about. Were they just studying these rules or were they having conversations with them? Um, and we are, most parents say they have talked with their kids at least about some of these things. Um, with this whole idea of trying to, they want to protect them and educate them, which is another theme that came up. We heard there's a lot of, I want to protect my kids, but I also want to help them learn for themselves what's right and wrong to be doing online. Um, parents give themselves pretty high marks, about three quarters say that they think these conversations have gone well. Interestingly, uh, as we looked at the parents of various generations, we can see that the generational mindsets formed and the parents' coming of age years really influence the conversations that those parents are having with their kids. Uh, millennial parents grew up and led the way into digital social communities and online gaming, and they're most likely to have conversations about online social interactions that their kids are having with people that those kids do and, and don't know, and what the kids are playing. Uh, millennial parents are trying to help these kids avoid the same mistakes that they have made, that they may have made. Um, Extra parents came of age when there was a lot of focus on content uh, with warning labels for music and examination of content ratings for movies and TV and games, uh, things like PG-13 coming of age during their time. Uh, and these Gen X parents are more likely to focus their conversations on what kids are watching. Uh, boomer parents are most often having conversations with their kids around the existential threat of interaction with creeps and things like hacking and privacy issues. And it's important to note that there's still one in 10 parents who have never discussed any of these key topics. Now, while this is more um, prevalent among parents of younger kids, it's still surprising given the amount of concern that they express to, express to us on a variety of topics. And also knowing that parents want to try and strike that balance between protection and education. Uh, as we can see in this, in this parent quote here, there's an, uh, it, there's an ongoing struggle for many parents between balancing control with teaching responsibility. So what are parents so concerned about? Let's hear it from them in this video. My concerns is just her taking in anything negative because she's such a nice person and I don't want the world or worldly things to saturate um, a, a kind heart. Bullying is like a teachable moment. If it happens, you can certainly deal with it after the fact, but um, things of a sexual nature are a lot harder to deal with after the fact. A predator is always my first concern. Um, the second concern is a uh, different type of predator, just like the boys in her school. For some reason, boys these days are extremely manipulative and controlling, and all the kids send each other nudes and look at porn, and it's just a different world than when we were growing up. They can make their own choices, and that's part of it is having their agency to make those choices, but we put the rules in place and to govern them and that they can make those decisions. All right, so based on what we uncovered in our qualitative exploration in the online communities with parents, we put a list of 25 topics of potential concern in front of parents in the online survey. And we learned that they are concerned about pretty much all of them. It's a pretty broad list. Parents have a lot of concern in this area. From a high level, three areas of general concern stand out. And as a reminder, the parents of seven to 11 year olds are the most concerned about all of these. Uh, so the three buckets are the external threats. So child predators, ID theft, bullies, hackers, scammers. 
uh, the, those existential threats that Richard was talking about. Uh, number two bucket is the sexually suggestive content, which includes pornography, but also um, just sexually suggestive content in videos, um, music, images. And then third um, are internal threats. More about kid-driven threats. <laughs> those kid-driven ones. So again, we see uh, with the parents and their background, we see them reflecting their mindsets in the time that they came of age. Um, millennial parents know online, socializ online socialization is important. Uh, millennial parents are more likely than Xer or Boomer parents with similarly aged kids to be concerned about these internal kid-driven or kid-focused behaviors, such as getting in trouble for inappropriate online behavior, social stress, uh, making purchases without permission, uh, under the radar activities like things uh, that they know they shouldn't be doing or things that they're trying to hide from their parents. Um, millennial parents are very aware of the repercussions in social circles due to the poor uh, behaviors online. So we've, we've talked a lot about parent concerns, but it's important to come back to those teens for a moment. Teens express a very impressive level of awareness of these concerns, and they're also more than willing to share their, their own concerns. They speak with authority on all of these three buckets. They've clearly had education around these and are aware that these are things that they should be worried about. Um, but teens' own concerns for themselves tend to be entirely focused on external threats. Um, and keeping those at bay because they believe that all of their own actions, of course, are very appropriate, that they would never look at things that they're not ready to handle and that they can absolutely deal with any of those internal threats. They don't think that they're gonna be doing anything wrong. Um, they believe that they know how to handle themselves, uh, which their parents don't always agree with, but it's an, it is um, reassuring to us to know that, parent, that kids do have, teens do have this awareness and are highly engaged with the idea of protecting themselves from those external threats. Right, so now given all these concerns, where does the responsibility lie? All generations agree, all generations of parents agree. The responsibility, responsibility lies most with parents, with themselves, but interestingly, millennial parents place less emphasis on themselves, showing a more balanced view of responsibility. So it's, it's how the generations are wired. As you've probably heard, boomers uh, were the helicopter parents. You may have heard Gen X parents called fighter jet parents. Um, and our more broadly held belief is that millennial parents are passenger plane parents. Uh, this shows up again in, uh, with a mindset that we're all in this together, this shared responsibility uh, that they have, that it's parents, children, and the greater community that are responsible. Uh, this shared responsibility, uh, this point of view is likely to grow over time. And in this context of responsibility, we wanted to make the point here that the open world of social media seems to hold the most anxiety for parents of teens. The confluence of people known and unknown having more unchecked access to kids in this forum, um, and they're entering the world of social media at a younger age as well. Uh, millennial parents specifically see social media as a big threat to kids and will definitely continue to want and expect support from the industry to help protect their kids on these platforms. And then bringing in the teen perspective again, uh, the teens we spoke with share a great amount of, want to share a great amount of responsibility for their own online safety. They actively want to take on this responsibility and feel that they are up to the task. Um, part of where the push against parental controls from a teen standpoint comes from is that they, they truly believe that this is a responsibility that lies with themselves. And they, as I said, believe that they are up to the task. They want to carry it. So now getting into solutions, parents uh, that we heard from have a range of uh, what they want from tools and controls. Ultimately, they tell us they're looking for solutions that are simple and customizable, but are also comprehensive. So pretty much everything. Uh, let's let them sum it up for us here. To best meet the needs for me and my family, we would require some type of software 
for digital security that would be comprehensive and customizable. Comprehensive being that it can cover all types of devices, all type of, types of social media platforms, so like your Facebook, your Twitter, um, online gaming systems, um, streaming media services. It's a one-stop shop. Ultimately, I don't want to have to go to 9, 10, 12, 15 different spots and try to like jot down a little information to tally up to create like an email or an Evernote or something like that. I want everything to be all in the same spot. Easy to use. Uh, that doesn't take several hours just to educate yourself and read directions and figure out what all do you need to do to get this to work. Uh, so ease of use is a very important thing. Me personally, it's difficult at times for me to understand certain things or how it works or I block one thing and unblock something else or just something that just makes it where it's like a three step instead of a 20 step. All right, so as we look at these digital solutions for digital threats, we see that most parents have used online safety tools. The tools for blocking adult or mature content are those tools that they can consider the most critical to them. Those are the ones they have used most often. And as we just discussed about the concerns, um, it is a little surprising that only a quarter have used social media controls. But as you know, these controls are often app-based, which makes them hard to set and to keep set. Uh, we see some parents talk about the appeal of passwords and pins uh, to try to combat their kids' efforts, likely due to this. Yes, those kids like to get around those settings. As we mentioned up front in our key takeaways, there is great interest in resources that could simplify digital parenting to help parents with that push-pull of trust versus responsibility and their desire for control. Um, parents want something that would make digital parenting less scary and less complicated. The key stat on this page is that one third number. Only one third of parents are generally satisfied with the online safety tools that they have used. This, the one-stop resource concept has a universal appeal with parents. Over 90% express interest in a website where they could learn about and research all of the different options available for digital safety and parental controls. Over half of parent, over half of all parents, and two thirds of parents uh, in that seven to eleven uh, age group of kids are very interested. Um, it makes sense given that they have the high, the greatest number of concerns and the greatest intensity of concern overall for those tweens. Two thirds of millennial parents think that are very interested in this concept. It feeds into that mindset that online safety is a responsibility to be shared. So a place where all sources in the community are working together definitely score points with millennial parents. When we look at resources currently being used by, by the different generations, um, we, can, uh, we see that the boomer parents are more likely to lean on online resources for information. So Google, essentially, while millennials are more likely to pull from a range of sources, social media, friends, the platform, the, the platforms themselves, which again reinforces how this one-stop shop could work well for them and why they would see value in this. So in our last word to sort of tie all of this together is a, re is a recommendation to keep the family dynamic in mind when we're working to help parents um, by putting safety controls in the right wrapper to make it more palatable to teens. We know that for teens, how you say something can be just as important as what you are saying to them. Know your audience. From a nomenclature standpoint, we talked with both parents and teens about how, what they would want these types of services to be called, these tools to be called. Um, from their standpoint, online parental controls versus online safety tools. One is about being controlled and the other is about being in control. So I bet you can guess which one the teens prefer. So the more palatable this is, the easier it makes the job for teen, for parents of teens, as well as tweens who are very wise and onto parents about what parental controls mean. So um, not only just this bigger picture idea of a one-stop shop, but also a nomenclature shift for some areas of the industry to think about this as a family process, not just a parent process.
We thank you all for your time. We thank very much FOSI for the opportunity to present this research. Thank you so much. Feel free to reach out to Rich or I with any questions. Um, and I'll be on the panel that's coming up next. I look forward to sharing some additional insights and answering some questions. Uh, and we also have a booth where we'd be delighted to talk with you after the panel as well. So thank you all so much for your time. Thank you. Well, and thank you very much for that excellent presentation. Molly and Rich, I think nomenclature is absolutely critical. Uh, I love that distinction between parental controls and online safety tools uh, and the findings that, you know, um, kids feel empowered if they actually have tools that they can use to block, to report, to remain private. Um, so it's a very good way of uh, reorientating ourselves towards these.